couldn't help but fall in love with Mother's gentleness and her kindness. She was always the woman of faith. No matter what kind of crisis or difficulty came her way, she never lost her grounding, which I believe could only have come from the fact that in her own heart and soul, she was united with our Lord. She believed we should be kinder than kindness itself, that no matter what else we did in life, no matter how efficient or professional we were, that everything stems from, from our kindness to other people. She's been influencing my life for my entire life. From miracle workers to martyrs, to those ordinary people living extraordinary lives of heroic virtue, these are the people that make us wonder if someday they might be saints. Mother Mary Angeline Theresa McCrory was born Bridget McCrory in 1893 in Northern Ireland. The family later moved to Scotland for financial reasons and lived next door to Holy Family Catholic Church. Bridget Theresa McCrory was born to parents Thomas and Bridget McCrory in Ireland in 1893, the second of the five McCrory children. Her early years were spent on the family farm and she grew up close to her maternal grandfather she was the playful ringleader amongst the children, but she also had a shy, serious, and pious side. She was tuned into the Lord at a young age, very pious. She could recite the prologue to John's Gospel from memory. She got the prize in school. So she was very much geared to the Lord from, an early, from her early childhood. Watching her mother care for her elderly grandfather at home helped inculcate in her the love for the elderly and the tenderness for the elderly. As Catholics in Northern Ireland at the time especially, her father found it very difficult to obtain work. When she was seven, the McCrory's moved to Carfin, Scotland in search of better job prospects. As she got older, she often stopped in Holy Family Church near the McCrory home to pray and help the pastor. Father Dean Croonan arranged the flowers to decorate the altar for feast days. He saw a religious vocation in Bridget, and the seeds of holiness, too. They lived right next to the parish church, so she was able to visit, make her visits to the Blessed Sacrament. She helped the parish priest. She arranged flowers for the altar. Mother um, saw adorning the altar with flowers as a way of praising God. She too was thinking of entering the convent. She'd been attending the Elmwood Convent School since she was 12. French was her favorite subject. She even started using the French spelling of her name. When she met the French nuns, the little sisters of the poor, as they came through town begging, she wasn't deterred by having to make her novitiate in France. The sisters dedicated themselves to caring for the elderly poor and begged to support themselves and those they cared for. The Little Sisters of the Poor have a custom of not, not accepting payment for the services that they provide to the elderly. They came to her house to beg, and her mother, of course, would let them in, and I'm sure had a cup of tea, and that was really her first introduction to the Little Sisters. The family would welcome them and give them whatever they could afford, and that's one way then Bridget McCrory got to know the Little Sisters and she felt the seeds of a vocation. When in 1911, her father tragically died in an accident at the steel mill where he worked, Bridget decided to enter the Little Sisters of the Poor the next year. Sadly, was severely burned in an accident and died young. 
leaving the mother and uh, widow and the family to be able to go on. It must have been hard for her to approach her mother and say, I, I think I would like to leave home. But her mother was very much uh, tuned to the will of God. She is somebody that I can relate to because she heard God calling her and she answered that call without hesitation. On her way to the train station, she stopped by the rectory to say goodbye to Father Crunin. As a farewell gift, he offered her any book she wanted from his library. And after she closed her eyes and picked, she saw she had chosen a biography of St. Teresa of Avila. Often she talked about Teresa and her doctrine. And that book and that story, when you look back, you say, well, is this some kind of a sign? Certainly, I think the Lord was at work in that choice. In 1912, at the age of 19, after having lived 12 years in Scotland, she joined the Little Sisters of the Poor in France. And I think that very much attracted her, um, the care of the elderly. And that was why she went to that congregation. And I think just to have um, a deeper prayer life. Um, mother loved the church and she loved her faith. And I think she just truly felt called by God to serve, to serve him. After a short postulancy, in Scotland. She went on to France, first to Paris to improve her French, and then to Latour for her novitiate. She took the religious name Sister Angeline of St. Agatha. In 1915, she professed her first vows. The First World War was raging, delaying her departure for her first assignment, Brooklyn, New York. In the meantime, she helped care for wounded soldiers in Latour until there was a ship ready to brave the German submarines menacing the Atlantic. She was stationed in their homes in Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Pittsburgh. And we always say it was there that she fell in love with the American people. It was pretty amazing for a younger sister. She was given responsibility. And eventually she became the superior administrator of that home in the Bronx. So that shows that the little sister saw something in her the next eight years she spent at St. Augustine's home in Brooklyn. Mother really felt for each older person. She felt she saw all the losses they went through, how leaving home was so difficult, uh, coming into a new environment, not having the control over their lives that they did. She wanted them to be seen and loved as, as who they were. By 1926, over the years, the now mother, Angeline, had formed the opinion that French customs didn't always best serve the aged in America. As superior in the Bronx, she implemented changes she thought made the American elderly more comfortable. She created a more middle-class home-like environment and celebrated American holidays with the residents. She encouraged their independence and freedom and permitted married couples to remain living together in the same room if they wished. She felt that there was a need for a different type of care. In those days, most religious communities came from Europe, and she felt there was a need for an American type of care. Mother's aim was never to, to leave the Little Sisters of the Poor. She was with them for 17 years. She just felt at the time she had grown to love the American people, and the way things were done in the United States, the kind of care that was rendered there, it was different than in Europe. We often talk about a call within a call. She loved the community that she was in. She really felt that from her vow of hospitality, she had to do something different for the American elderly. By their Dionysius Flanagan took a large bouquet of the roses and decided to bring them to the Little Sisters of the Poor and Mother Angeline at Our Lady's home. We often say that when your prayer has been answered, if you pray to the little flower, that you'll receive a rose. She did take that as a sign, and I think that could have been the final decision to affiliate with the Carmelite Order. She approached Patrick Cardinal Hayes of New York with her ideas and asked for advice. He, too, thought that more needed to be done for the elderly. He encouraged her to strike out on a new path. If it was God's will, she would succeed, he told her. This gave her the courage to move forward. 
he encouraged her to be faithful to her vision and that he would help them in any way that he could. And she kind of poured out her, her heart to him that she didn't want to do this, but she didn't see any other way. He listened to her struggle, and I think he gave her the confidence then to go ahead and do what she did. In 1929, she and six other sisters received a dispensation from Rome to leave the Little Sisters of the Poor. And it was extremely painful. Her whole life it was very painful, thinking about that, but she knew she had to go forward. The founding sisters of the Carmelites of the Aged and Infirm stayed temporarily with the Spark Hill Dominicans. The teaching sisters helped Mother Angeline and the other sisters sew their new brown habits. The new community would be Carmelite. She was given an empty rectory in Upper Manhattan to start with. In September 1929, she opened St. Martin of Tours' home with seven residents. In 1931, the new community became officially affiliated to the Order of Carmel. I can't imagine what it was like walking into that rectory and setting up. When she entered the Carmelite Sisters and they were getting themselves organized, she changed her name to Sister Angeline Teresa. A mother had a great love of the Carmelite saints, in particular St. Teresa of Avila and St. Therese, the Little Flower. And I think she just really drew on that Carmelite spirituality. Mother Angeline was ahead of her time and faced criticism for her approach to elder care. She got rid of the constrained institutional feel more typical of the time in favor of a cozier, warmer atmosphere. She also included rehabilitation care in the services and more opportunities for recreation and entertainment. With time, the emerging science of gerontology would vindicate her instincts and silence her critics. Mother Angeline always stressed that we were to care for the residents in a home-like environment. And today, that's very much called for by state regulations, and I often think we were ahead of the time. When the residents are admitted to our homes, Mother used to encourage that they bring little things that belong to them so that they, that room would feel like home. The Great Depression was also settling over the country as she was opening the first convent. But nothing deterred her. On the contrary, the community grew quickly and she opened homes at lightning speed. When they would open a new foundation, she would always go and cook and clean for the other sisters as they helped to set up the house. She helped to decorate the chapel. She was full of joy that now there would be another tabernacle for the Lord. And she mixed with the sisters and encouraged them in, you know, so very many ways. Mother's gentleness with the residents, always smiling with the residents, serving them in the dining room. She was extremely kind, um, always wanted nothing but the best for the residents. And I don't mean best in, in good quality, best in kindest, best in giving, best in knowing their needs, and in knowing their needs, how would we, could we meet those needs? And that was Mother's, I think, greatest quality that she taught us and taught all of her sisters. The Carmelite Sisters' homes, the atmosphere to this day is bright, optimistic, friendly, warm, home-like, and that reflects her spirit. She was able to bring those who followed her and whom she trained to walk in the same path. Kindness was one of her outstanding virtues. She always showed the volunteers of the nursing homes her gratitude and had little gifts for them. She loved the elderly, but the youth of the newest members of the community energized her. She often said that she never wanted to live in a house without novices, and she never did. She taught her sisters to give the elderly tender and affectionate care. Her writings are just beautiful that encourage each of us as her sisters. And she was tried to be kinder than kindness to anybody that she encountered and, and tried to teach us to do the same. She always said, care for the elderly residents as you would for your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather. And I think her warmth and her compassion it still is very important in the care today. She was a extremely strong woman, and she had to be tough when she had to be tough, but she was extremely kind on the other hand and extremely generous. 
she had a very kind and human approach to how she governed the sisters. She said efficiency is wonderful, but kindness should be the hallmark of our homes. She was the superior general and foundress, but she was the easiest person to talk to, and she always showed genuine interest in your life and what you hope to be. Uh, she was very inspirational to young women who were looking for their religious vocation. I was a novice up here. You know, Mother really lived here, and as novices, we would see her. Uh, occasionally, she'd give us a class, but we certainly felt her presence. From sixth grade on, I saw Mother Angeline working, as well as the sisters all working, until I went through high school and saw the great and kindness and hardworking sisters that they were as well, for, as well as their joyfulness. Their joyfulness truly is what attracted me. I was coming up here since 1955 as a baby and it was just a common thing to do. And we saw all the sisters and she would take care of us. And then it started to dawn on me how big a thing the Carmelite system had become and how important it was to the elderly. Her Irish sense of humor stayed with her even after decades in America. Her laughter was contagious. Mother Angeline loved inviting and often visiting with clergy, from cardinals to parish priests. She often turned these meetings into parties with the sisters, playing and singing music. She was friends with many of the most influential churchmen of her time, but she hobnobbed with cardinals with the naturalness that comes with humility the honor she paid them came from seeing Christ in them. In 1957, the Carmelites of the aged and infirm received official approval as a religious congregation. On the heels of this approval followed the Second Vatican Council, whose teachings she embraced as she saw that responding to the needs of the time was at the core of her work. When she celebrated her golden jubilee as a religious, and 30 years since the founding of the Carmelites of the Aged and Infirm, she had opened 40 nursing homes. The count would reach 59 by the time that she died. She's a person for our times, who saw people as individuals, loved them in whatever state she found them. You could see that Mother was maybe struggling. She always did it with such a smile. In 1978, she stepped down as the community's top leader. Her bond with the sisters and religion grew deeper and tenderer. As she declined and needed more and more of the care she had given to others, she accepted it amiably. Even as she grew quite frail, she loved to gather the sisters together and sing, sometimes she directed too. She who had worked her whole life to take care of the aged and the infirm when she herself was aged and infirm, she took it with such graciousness. In January 1984, she suddenly took a turn for the worse. She died surrounded by her sisters at St. Teresa Mother House at Avila on Hudson in Germantown, New York. Every year we celebrate Mother's anniversary on January 21st, and it's the anniversary of her birth and her death. Every time you talk to her, from the time I was little till the last time I talked to her. There was an aura about her. In 1989, her cause for beatification and canonization was introduced in the Diocese of Albany. There were just pages and pages of writing, and I, I think they really determined that she was a truly holy person. When all the testimony is gathered from relevant witnesses, a document called the Positio is assembled and sent to Rome to be analyzed by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. We had a lot of witnesses, almost 70 witnesses. We sent uh, 12,000 pages. On June 28, 2012, Pope Benedict XVI issued a formal decree declaring her to have lived a life of heroic virtue, therefore venerable. I got the phone call and I was just over the moon. There was just such excitement. I, it was just a wonderful, wonderful call to get. And they did grasp her faith, her spirit of hope, her charity. We wanted to have a place really where the public could come to, as I say, meet Mother and get to know her and her charism and the history of our congregation. We are very blessed to have many items that belong to Mother. Uh, things that were used by her, her prayer books, her uh, rosary beads, 
And probably the highlight of the Heritage Center is a reproduction of her room and her office, which is just a wonderful thing for many of our sisters. It's been very moving, you know, to go in there now and hear her voice again. The Catholic Church uses miracles to confirm sainthood because it shows that the person is in heaven with God interceding for us. All we need is one tiny verifiable miracle and we need people to pray to Mother um, for that. The Catholic Church reserves the term miracle only for those cases of extraordinary cures from a serious condition not liable to go away on its own, one that's instantaneous, complete, and lasting, and most difficult that there is no medical treatment that relates to the cure. There have been numbers of favors like that that have occurred over the years. But the church's criteria for miracles is very clear. We did think we had one miracle, but after the canonical process in the Diocese of Metuchen, the information went to Rome. In 2009, the Diocese of Metuchen in New Jersey opened an investigation into a potential miracle through the intercession of Mother Angeli, the lessening of a genetic abnormality. The miracle investigation that we did in the Diocese of Metuchen quite thoroughly involved an unborn child who in the womb was diagnosed with a certain form of dwarfism. The child was born with evidence of remarkable bone growth, so much so that some began to believe it to be a miracle. The Consulta Romana at the Vatican decided that there was not enough prenatal testing done to compare it to the testing after birth and therefore said that it was not a miracle. Now the cause for canonization for Mother Angeline is in search of a new verified medical miracle. In all the favors we've dealt with, those involved have always believed that through the intervention of Mother Angeline, that something positive happened there uh, that's unexplainable. There have been many claims of seemingly miraculous favors through the intercession of Mother Angeline, from the finding of employment to a cure from stage four cancer. One such incredible story is that of a girl named Alana who was diagnosed with a rare form of hydrocephalus. When we went for the 20-week sonogram, we were told that she had a significant brain abnormality um, and that you know, it was going to be a very questionable outcome. Hydrocephalus is a condition in which an accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid occurs within the brain that causes increased pressure inside the skull and often results in brain damage with cognitive delays. It's pretty scary and horrifying and upsetting and shocking um, because other than her very large head size, which was 47 centimeters at birth, um, Alana looked like every other baby. You know, she was beautiful. When Alana was born early, an MRI was performed following the insertion of a shunt a mechanical valve and tube to reroute fluid from the brain to the abdominal cavity. It revealed a much rarer and more serious condition, holoprosencephaly, a condition where the brain fails to develop into two hemispheres, normally separated by a membrane, the corpus callosum. And so to think that there could be this major malformation inside of her brain was pretty frightening. Its prognosis is extremely poor, and in the worst forms, there are severe facial anomalies, including the lack of a nose or just one eye, and kidneys or other double organs merged into a single median structure. My mom was a friend with someone whose friend was a Carmelite sister. And so from that point on, the sisters were praying for Alana. It was a beautiful fall day, and it was before I went back to work. So she must have been about two months old. Um, we came up with um, my mom and her friend to visit their friends here and to thank the nuns for praying for Alana. Um, we had a lovely tour around the, uh, the grounds and we went to visit Mother Angeline's grave. And when we got down to the grave, um, Sister took Alana in her arms and actually rested her on top of the tombstone. And at that point, Alana started to laugh, like really like belly laugh, just out loud and her whole little body was shaking. Um, it's not something that two to three month old babies really do, so it was very noteworthy. And it was, I think, definitely a, a sign of good things to come. After Alana was first born, we would go to see the neurosurgeon and the neurologist. It was every three months and every six months. 
and you know, kind of continuing on. And I know that every time we went to visit them and we sat in the waiting room um, with Alana who was walking and talking and reading and sitting amongst all those people who were not doing those things, that we always felt you know, blessed. And the doctors were always happy and surprised to see her because that wasn't often their experience with their, their patients. Going to the first um, meeting of the early intervention intake team in the public school district and the director coming into the room looking at and saying, looking at the paperwork that listed all the diagnoses and asking, are we really putting this child in a regular classroom? And I said, absolutely. Alana has always exceeded everyone's expectations, whether ours or the, the medical doctors. I mean, they expected her to go to a little school, you know, every day. They would not be expecting her to, you know, go to college. When you think about all those potential diagnoses and then you see who Alana is today, a college student, um, clearly a huge blessing. We're very grateful to Mother Angelina and all of the sisters for their prayers. She's the reason that I am here today, that I'm a healthy adult. The doctor said that it'd be lucky if I could function, walk, talk, feed myself. I firmly believe that it's because of Mother Angeline's intercession and all the sisters who prayed for us that I am here today relatively normal and college student. I hope to be a special ed preschool teacher. She devoted her life to taking care of other people and I, something I do like to emulate in my own life. Someday when two miracles are found and validated by Rome, Mother Mary Angeline Teresa McCrory will go down as one of the great saints in the history of the Catholic Church in America. Her life was a perfect example of how we can make the world a better place. I think when we are always feeling a little desperate, you know, that Mother Angeline is always the person that we pray to. We pray to her to make sure everybody stays on track in the family. I wouldn't hesitate to pray to Mother for anything because if it's God's will, you'll get it. In my mind, she already is a saint, but um, I do think that in my lifetime, we will see that. I certainly hope Mother would be declared a saint. I think she's a saint for our times in her love for the elderly and her respect for the dignity of each person. This has been They Might Be Saints. I'm Michael O'Neill. Thanks for watching.